Do we have our panelists on board? I'm here. I'm Louise. Hello. Hi, this is Jeffrey. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hi, Jill's here. All right. So now today we're going to be, uh, or this afternoon, we're going to be talking about driving continuous improvement across finance ops and global shared services. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have three wonderful panelists. And why don't we um, get a little information from each of you? Uh, Jill, tell us about you a little bit. Um, so I uh, oversee shared services and treasury for a company called Barton Mallow, which is a large company that's run like a family business. So uh, it's been fun to be in this role and to try to um, help us have gains and improvements. My background prior to this was 30 plus years in automotive uh, manufacturing and supply. Uh, so thankfully I already had a very strong, lean and efficient uh, background before I came over here so I could bring a lot of those uh, project skills to this role. Now, Jill, it also, uh, you know, you've spent a great deal of time developing your current team. Um, lots of work there, and we'll get into that a little bit. What, but what did you find the most um, rewarding about putting a team together? Um, you know, in my old role, you know, there was a, it's a very different culture. I'm sure that some folks here have come from uh, automotive background where things are all about cost reduction. Uh, so, you know, you would try to build a team with as few people as you can. And a lot of times you would end up being the only one doing all the work, no one to bounce things off of. Having a team that I can work with, that I've been able to develop, um, who be, have become subject matter experts in their particular role, and then being able to leverage that as a team lift instead of an independent person lift has been amazing. You know, uh, because I can only think of what I can think of but when all of us are working together, it's it's really much better. Oh, I love it, Jill. Senior Manager, Treasury and Shared Services at Barton Mallow. Uh, Jeffrey Capulong, yeah. Finance Transformation <laughs> Consultant, working freelance. You've, uh, you're an experienced leader with a demonstrated history of working in the finance, shared service industry and manufacturing. You're skilled in business transformation, process migration. Tell us a little bit more about uh, your work history. Yep. Thank you, Rob. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Jill and Louis. Um, yeah, I'm originally from the Philippines and I recently moved to Canada, so I'm in Toronto as well. Um, so um, I'm a freelance consultant and currently leading a project uh, to transition uh, financial services to a BPO um, and to establish a global business services uh, for the retain organization. Uh, before this, I spent 18 years at Coca-Cola, Butler's Business Services in the Philippines. Uh, my career highlights include leading ERP transformation and managing financial services. Um, I was one of the pioneer leaders um, who established the shared services entity uh, at the Coca-Cola in the Philippines. Um, and throughout my career, I've handled various roles um, from transition and account management uh, to procure to pay senior manager role and serve as the head and president of the shared service entity. Um, I'm passionate about continuous improvement and driving finance transformation, and I really look forward to imparting valuable learnings to you uh, by the end of this session. Wonderful. And our next panelist has worked in financial operations for over 30 years and started her career at the Walt Disney Company in London. Since then, she's worked for several well-known companies and now works as a financial operations consultant for a travel company. Louise Graham, financial operations consultant, currently working with Travel Chapter. little insight on yourself there, Louise. Yeah, of course. Hello, everyone. Nice nice to meet you all and nice to see you again, Jeffrey and Rob and Jill. Um, I'm a financial operations consultant. I've been a contractor for about 20 of my 30 years in shared services. Uh, so that's very interesting because you have to get into a company, absorb the culture, find out what the deliverable is and deliver very quickly uh, or you don't last as an interim. So um, I've worked at Disney as somebody, uh, as Rob just mentioned. I've also done a bit of telco, a bit of banking, a bit of public sector, um, and now I'm working in travel. Um, and I love people and process, and that's what Shared Services is all about. So that's why I'm here today. Wonderful. Welcome, panelists. Uh, we're going to start off again talking about driving continuous improvement across finance ops. And um, let's start off with 
with a, a question here. So we've spoken a lot about building culture to support different initiatives today uh, throughout the whole, uh, well, here morning and afternoon to our attendees. So perhaps you can address how we can foster a culture which supports continuous improvement. So Jill, I'll start with you, because I guess change management is pretty key here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you're working with especially folks in the finance world, you're probably going to find a fair bit of people who don't really like change and uh, have their processes memorized. And um, you know how that goes. You may have memorized a broken process and be very good at it, but that doesn't mean that that's the best thing. Um, so I found that you have to steer the ship slowly, turn it slowly or else you could have problems. Um, I've spent a lot of time uh, engaging with the people on my team, engaging with other stakeholders, understanding pain points, working as a team, getting their buy-in and how we can solve the problem together. Um, I think you can never walk in and just say, this is what we're going to do and believe that you're not going to have people who are oppositional, people who are neutral. And then there's a few people who love change and want to see a process improve. I feel like getting that buy-in and that collaborative um, input is absolutely necessary in order for that whole thing to be a success and to have a culture of improvement. Jeffrey, you're yeah. you mentioned Coca-Cola background, um, changing the mindset and customer service. You know, it's all about this change. You got to adapt. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> no, I mean, uh, in, in our case, uh, because when, you know, when we shut up shared services, we, we we knew that we have to build um, culture around you know um, shared services mindset and that includes continuous improvement. Um, uh, but of course, you know uh, there are several areas that includes leadership commitment, training and development, you know performance metrics, um, standardization and documentation, and so on and so forth. But employee engagement is one of the key um, areas that you know um, we 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 knew we needed uh, to build that culture of continuous improvement or having that continuous improvement mindset. So what we did, we created this program, what we call JDI or Just Improve, uh, Just Do It in Initiative. Um, in fact, our logo was um, the Jedi Star Wars. You know, uh, so to make it more fun and engaging. Um, and that is to recognize small initiatives. That's why it's called Just Do It. So anything that you see that you can, you know, um, improve, even if just, you know, a simple step, you know, an Excel, you know, template that you can build a simple macro, uh, a report that, you know, that you can generate like through Viva table, uh, those things, you know, just, just to, you know, inculcate that discipline of um, continuous improvement. Um, because, you know, engaging employees at all levels uh, by by encouraging them <clears throat> to identify um, areas for improvement and involve them in the decision making process will make them feel you know that they are being um, recognized and uh, their inputs are being valued. Um, you know, creating these platforms for sharing ideas such as um, suggestion boxes, brainstorming sessions, or innovation teams, or in our case, uh, this uh, recognition program, which you know recognize and reward contributions to to improvement initiatives. Amazing. Louise, talk about CI a little bit for us. Okay, well, first of all, I love Jedi, just do it. I love that. And I'm going to steal that definitely in future roles, 100% Jedi mind trick, just do it. So I love that. Um, I think one of the things about continuous improvement is that people who are operating the processes need to realize it doesn't have to be a huge, great big change. It's not a big program. It can be little things that make the difference to your working day or your process or, you know, or, or, your, or your policies and so on. Uh, so I think it's about making it easy for people to make changes. I think Jedi is a great example. Um, and I think it's also uh, really important to capture the improvements and um, but not make it bureaucratic for people. But you need to capture them because you need to be able to go back and say six months later, what are all the improvements we made? And they might be small things. Uh, to give an example, uh, somewhere recently, we've improved the speed of a payment run by just sorting in a different way uh, on our creditors. And it saved two hours. Really quick, really easy. Yeah. And if we hadn't captured it on a spreadsheet, we wouldn't have it as part of our, hey, this is one of our improvements. So I think it's really important to capture it. Uh, spreadsheet bit old fashioned, but you know, we love a spreadsheet in finance, mm -hmm. don't we? So uh, I think it's really important to capture it. I think it's really important to go back and look at 
the improvements you've made and what the impact was so to measure the impact of them as well um and i think make it easy for people make it really easy for people to say hey i've got an idea um and to implement it make it simple love it so guys clearly continuous improvement needs to be targeted and measured how are you guys using data to target and measure ci let's start with you jill well we uh implemented some Kaizans. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but it's where you sort of get a group of people together and deconstruct a process and break it out um, by using workflows and counting steps and counting um, your inactive time versus your active time to try to figure out if there's a better path to get things through. Uh, I've done a few of those already. Uh, one of them is with regards to accounts payable. Uh, we were decentralized. Uh, we were running about 35 days from invoice date to input. Uh, and uh, there was some 40 steps involved in the process. And a lot of it was this paper shuffling from one person's inbox or, or even electronic folder to another. Um, we were able then to uh, bring in a software product where it's now centralized and sent out electronically that there's you know automatic reminders and then auto posting once the information's added. You know, so being able to look at the difference between our days outstanding and then of course quantifying the time that is saved um, in each step of that process so that you can have a dollar for time because that's really how it is. Now that doesn't mean that we're um, letting folks go. Uh, what that means is that our folks are going to be able to be repurposed to do higher level work, more satisfying work than shuffling papers around, things like that. And Jeffrey, you know, back to measuring customer service satisfaction, very important with you. Yeah, yeah, you're correct. And in fact, aside from aside from that, I'll, I'll elaborate more about customer feedback. But I just, you know, I just um, remember that, you know, one of the um, uh, the way to measure is really, you know, starting from the incidents, the actual incidents that happen, you know, those issues, because you have those um, um, incidences um, like overpayment and you, you, you know, you'll come up with an action plan. And one of those is how you're going to improve to address, you know, a potential overpayment eventually. But, but uh, more importantly is to get feedback from the customer. So we gather and analyze feedback from internal and external um, customers to understand their experiences and identify um, areas for improvement. Uh, so through CSAT or customer satisfaction surveys, uh, feedback forms, and net promoter scores. So it provides valuable qualitative and um, quantitative data. Uh, um, and it's actually a win-win situation for the shared services because um, you will be able to address the concerns of your customers, satisfy them, and, and also deliver um, efficiency, efficiency through, through the improvements that you will be making as a result of you know, um, um, those feedback or addressing those feedback. So by using um, data like CSAT and, and NPS um, to target and measure our CA efforts, we ensure that our initiatives are focused, um, effective, and aligned with, the, with our overall business objectives and our customer needs. Luis, talk to us about uh, the time to process an invoice when it comes to CI. Yeah, sure. I, uh, Jill, that, that's a lot of steps to uh, before you even get to actually putting an invoice on a system, isn't it? Um, that's interesting to hear that. So one of the things um, I've looked at recently is all the activities in a shared service center. And we looked at what are the activities? How long do they take us? Really old fashioned sort of time and motion. So we've got you know, this many invoices. Each one takes us that long to process. And we looked at what was really burning our time and was it value add? So was it really stuff that was useful to our internal customers and our colleagues and our suppliers or was it just paper pushing and processing. Mm -hmm. um, and from that, we identified an activity that was really low value add, very labor intensive, really, really hard. And that's where we decided to target our efforts because that was where we were going to get uh, the best result for our team, really, um, and stop doing a, a process that was just, um, it had to be done. It was a, I, I won't tell you what it was, but it was, it's a process that had to be done. It was important for compliance. Uh, it was important for suppliers and important for internal customers. It was very dull, very manual, very time consuming. And so we said, actually, what's going to have the biggest impact in terms of making our lives better for everybody? And it was that process. So we targeted that. And then we started looking at, can we automate it? Can we simplify it? Or can we eliminate it? Uh, and the goal is eliminate it if it's, you know, if it's, if it's not needed. And, and quite often you do find that things aren't actually needed anymore. They're just being done because they were always being done. Uh, but if you can't, if you can simplify them, that's great. And even better if you can automate it so that a human doesn't have to touch it at all. 
but, you know, that that's the uh, holy grail, really. Yeah. Winner, winner, for sure. Um, which areas of finance do you see the most scope for improvement and value add? Um, Jill, you, you know, it's, it's talk about vendor onboarding. Yeah, so um, I'm sure it's different for every company. And obviously, there's a lot larger companies than us. But uh, because we're construction, we source local. You know, you don't get concrete from an, like a, uh, somebody far away just because you got a better price, you're going to go local. And what that means is that we onboard a very high number of vendors every month. Um, most of those are not needing a purchase order in order to do business with them. Um, so we've had to add bureaucracy to uh, mitigate any fraud risk. Uh, it's become an excru excruciating uh, process for our vendors, for my team, for the organization. Uh, and so we are implementing a new software process where the vendors onboard themselves. Uh, I'm very excited about this. Um, and then on the other side of it, there is um, uh, early warning, which you may be familiar with. Uh, banks collaborate together to verify bank name ownership and account information so you can make sure that the company that you're paying really is the company you're paying. Um, the other nice thing is, uh, I would say probably 90% of our vendor applications currently are being filled out by our own people, uh, and they're probably being filled out from an invoice. They probably already bought everything. They have the invoice at their desk, and now they're filling out the information based on what's seen. And if you know anything, an invoice doesn't have, for instance, necessarily the corporate address, just a remittance address, you know, things like that. Uh, so I'm very excited to be able to move this from this manual process, including like moving emails from one box to the next to make sure that this was validated, this was verified um, to a ticket system where we can just have one vendor line that we're keeping track of, that we can see where it is. It's very visual. And I'm um, hoping to see some great gains there. Louise, what would you like to add to that? Yeah, like, I think actually if we're talking, accounts payable is... It's always lovely to to do continuous improvement in because it ought to be simple and it isn't. It's just paying your bills. It really should be simple. But actually, there are a lot of component parts to it. So supplier onboarding, um, you know, that's always a complicated process. I think wherever you go, uh, getting the invoice in, checking it's correct, checking it is indeed a supplier um, and, and all that kind of thing. So uh, I have um, managed a project uh, which was a, a really good improvement project uh, in accounts payable. And this was uh, suppliers being paid late in a public sector organisation. Um, and uh, this public sector organisation in the UK had a goal of paying all valid supplier invoices within five working days of receipt. So anyone who works in accounts payable will be doing a sharp intake of breath at the uh, short length of time that is. Um, and we realised, so we needed to look at the problem and examine it. And we understood that the problem was coming from two places, really. So it was coming from our internal people who weren't receiving purchase orders. Uh, that will also be familiar to anyone in accounts available. And it was also coming from our suppliers who were billing us to above the value of a purchase order, uh, which, again, is unacceptable. So we tackled it from both sides um, and we involved the procurement team um, and we brought the suppliers in. We brought in the, the top 20 suppliers, which accounted for the majority of the issue. We brought them in. We shared with them our process uh, we asked them to start uh, drawing down on value of purchase orders and keeping records of those purchase orders and then we also tackled our internal colleagues uh, we got them into meetings with our procurement team again in the room and said please start receipting and here's the impact of non-receipting we can't we can't pay your agency it was agency contractors in this case and that sort of two-pronged approach, approaching it from both sides, worked really well because actually the suppliers started working with the internal colleagues who started working with procurement um, and understanding our P2P process, which was really critical. Um, and I think that was lots of little things that we kept doing that led to a big improvement in uh, payment practices, actually. Um, and so the suppliers were happier. They got paid to terms. Um, we were happier because our reporting showed that we were hitting our deadline of uh, valid invoices paid within five working days um, and um, internal people were happy because we weren't chasing them to receive their orders because they just knew when to do it and it became something they did day to day so uh, yeah that was a lovely project very very satisfying at the end of it uh, but that was lots of little continuous improvements that added up to a big change seems like everybody was happy and 
that's that's the ultimate goal. Jeffrey, do you have any insight uh, into the uh, subject? Um, I, I think for me, it's anything that is um, heavily manual, repetitive, you know, transactional um, task. Um, because the demand now of the, the CFO being, you know, the, the, the key stakeholder for finance operation. Um, is to transform, you know, fi especially financial aid services from being back office support to, you know, to a business partner. So providing insights, analysis, rather than just doing those heavily manually um, tasks. And you can only do this if you will, you know, improve or, or um, automate uh, those uh, manual uh, processes. What does the future hold, Jill, when it comes to our subject today? Well, I think that by the time we all retire, we will have installed an easy button that you just hit and then everything gets processed and paid. Uh, that's my goal. Uh, so I'm going to work toward that until the to the day I decide to go somewhere warm and leave it to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Jeffrey, um, talk to us yeah. about cybersecurity and data privacy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with, with all this automation, um, AI, um, we need to make sure that, you know, as a financial services, um, increasingly rely on digital platforms, um, um, strengthening cybersecurity measures and ensuring um, data privacy will be critical. Um, this involves implementing robust security protocols, um, regular audits, compliance, and evolving regulations. And Louise, we talk about it all the time, more automation and AI. Yeah, robotic process automation is something I'd like to see a lot more of. We've, uh, I think in shared services in general and accounts payable in particular, there are a lot of very manual, low value, high effort, painful manual processes. And where machines can read invoices and just put them straight into your system, why wouldn't you let them? Um, I have actually worked in a couple of businesses in the last five years where they are still manually keying invoices, if you can believe it. And Oh, sorry, my, my internet dropped out for a second, where business is still manually keying invoices, uh, which is just unbelievable to me. Uh, not the business I'm in now and uh, not, not the ones in the last couple of years. So I think automation is going to be really interesting for things like adding supplier bank details, uh, adding new suppliers, uh, keying invoices and, and managing the purchase to pay process in terms of matching invoices to purchase orders automatically. So, you know, humans don't need to get involved in that where there's a system being used properly. Wonderful. Uh, Jill, some final thoughts. Uh, so I guess shared services is unique, right? In that it's like a stool and it has like really good people, really good processes, and then continuous improvement. And I think that no matter how long you work in shared services, you're never really done. Uh, so if you can foster a culture where you can bring your team along to want to keep doing the better thing, I think that you're doing the right thing. Jeffrey? Yeah, I totally agree with Jill. I believe that um, shared service is not a destination, so it's a journey. So having that continuous improvement mindset, will, you know, it's a very key, important um, behavior or discipline that we need to have in the shared services. And Louise? Yeah, I agree with Jill. There are three parts to it, absolutely people, process and continuous improvement. And I think you are always striving and you will never, ever be done. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think continuous improvement is about making processes better which makes people's lives better and makes people's jobs more satisfying and actually ultimately gives your customer your internal customer or your suppliers a much better experience and that's what we're all here to do in shared services is give a great experience to our internal customers and our suppliers and our colleagues yeah. so you know anything that can improve that and improve people's working lives is is good with me and uh yeah it's all about people and process and i love both so Guys, thank you very much for your time. It's been very informative. Um, and to our attendees, you can see their names there. You can follow them, find them on LinkedIn if you want to reach out to them directly. I'm sure the three of you would be more than happy to have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussion with anybody that has some questions. Uh, but before my panelists leave, I've been kind of having a little fun this afternoon with different uh, puns and dad jokes and i just want to ask you guys and kind of tell you a little something did you know the first french fries weren't actually cooked in france they were cooked in greece <laughs> 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 <laughs>